Okay, uh, right. If talking about COVID-19 really burns you up, it's about to get hot in here. I have a couple of disclosures. We have a Johnson Johnson study we're doing ourselves. We're past the injection phase and into the follow-up side effect phase. Uh, the U of L is also designated as um, Pfizer's North American Center of Excellence for Vaccine Preventable Diseases. So here's my outline, and um, I want to go through these things. The first thing I'll do is an overview of COVID-19. As you can see, this is COVID-19 from its very beginning <clears throat> last year, and I tried to map out where uh, each of these uh, vaccines started approximately, and uh, right here is 2001. So if you look at this figure, it doesn't look like the vaccines have done too much, um, especially uh, lately we have this surge, and I'd like to say perhaps the surge is mainly from countries that don't have access to too much vaccine, because really where would this curve be if we didn't have vaccines? It may be up here at the yellow line or even the red line. Um, so perhaps the vaccines have done more than we think. If you th look at just the vaccines in the United States, we have three, and it looks like we've had a better response to our, our vaccines. Of course, there's not an exact correlation between the two, but it does look pretty good here. If we consider what's happened in Kentucky, we've got uh, about a third of the population vaccinated. And since January of this year, we've had a nice downward trend of the number of COVID um, cases per day. So that, that also looks pretty good. Um, in the, I wanna go into a case and I want you to think about the thrombosis that we've heard on the radio and television lately as you hear this case. 56 year old male with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia and diabetes presented at night after being found down at home and admitted for a seizure and mental status changes. Earlier in the evening, he complained of blurry vision. EMS witnessed seizure-like activity and urinary incontinence. He said he was watching TV and then awakened in the ER. In the ER, he complained of shortness of breath, and then it was found out he had received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine one week prior. He had a BMI of 55. His O2 saturation was low and came up with four liters of oxygen. His right lung had decreased breath sounds. He had no neurological deficits. His platelets were 184,000. A CT of the head was normal. And you see his chest x-ray there. On the MRI of his brain, he had these small punctate lesions scattered throughout all of the cuts. So um, it showed infarcts throughout the left cerebral hemisphere consistent with the thromboembolic process. And so what was uh, again found out was that he had SARS-CoV-2 positive which is a, another variable, and the infection itself can cause a blood dyscrasia. So perhaps this guy did not have a problem with the vaccine. If we look at an outline, I want to show you a broad spectrum of what's happened in 2020 and 2021 with our two vaccines. Um, there was an AstraZeneca study in September that was started, and uh, we all heard of this case of transverse myelitis in Great Britain. Now, in retrospect, I wonder if the person had a thrombus go to their spinal artery and gave them symptoms like transverse myelitis, but we'll never know because they don't share a lot of details. Four days later, that study was resumed. Then the next month, October, Johnson Johnson study was paused because of an undisclosed event that still has not been disclosed to this day. And about two weeks later, that study was resumed. So at the end of December, the AstraZeneca study, I mean, the AstraZeneca vaccine was given emergency use authorization in Europe and started. Then in February, the Johnson & Johnson study was granted emergency use authorization. And I have to say that uh, these vaccines, none of them are FDA approved. They're all granted emergency use authorization status. There is a difference. Then in early March, Johnson Johnson vaccine started in the public. And in this gray bar here, a whole lot happened with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So let's go over that. In early March, there were uh, reports of cerebral thrombotic embolic events with AstraZeneca. Then on March 15th, more than 20 European countries suspended the use of the vaccine. The drug company AstraZeneca, the World Health Organization, and EMA, which is European Medical Authority, claimed there's no evidence to blame the vaccine. 
And then EMA and AstraZeneca vaccines say it's safe and effective. The European countries start reusing it just three days later. And then uh, there's reviews of UK where they find 79 thrombotic events with decreased platelets in 20 million patients. So the next day, UK, Germany, France, Canada, and the Netherlands restrict AstraZeneca vaccine to older people. WHO and the EMA say that it's a rare side effect, but the benefits still outweigh the risks of giving the vaccine. Two weeks later, Denmark stops completely after two Danish people have thromboses in 150,000 people vaccinated, and later it's suspended by Norway, and Iceland limits it to people greater than 60 years of age. So now let's jump back in our timeline and talk about Johnson & Johnson. Between March 19th and April 12th, there were six cases of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis in patients who also had decreased platelets. Then the next day, Johnson Johnson study was paused for clotting, and a week and a half later, it was resumed. And then a couple of days later, there was a report of somebody with a DVT in their leg. So uh, let me move my window here. Let's review the mechanism of action of viral vector vaccines for a moment. If you recall, a coronavirus is an RNA virus. So in the laboratory, it is uh, reverse transcribed to DNA, and that is put into an attenuated adenovirus that does not cause infection. And that is what's put into a syringe and injected in somebody's arm. So the adenovirus makes its way into our cell and into our nucleus and does not, the DNA does not come in contact with our DNA. There's no microchip, but it uses our machinery to transcribe it back into RNA. And then our endoplasmic reticulum creates it to, translates it to a protein and you have just the spike protein. So the code is not for the entire coronavirus, but just for the spike protein. Then that spike protein is recognized by an antigen presenting cell, which is presented to a T helper cell and eventually stimulates B cells to make antibodies to just the spike protein in case we are exposed to coronavirus. That way we can recognize the coronavirus and the spike proteins on the coronavirus and tag it for destruction. So April 9th, there were two studies released in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this re revealed um, mostly females in five patients and 11 patients who had had thromboses. They were all under 50 except for one. And the time from the vaccine to the, their symptoms was seven to 10 days. And most of them had cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, CVST. And if they didn't have that, they had a major vessel blockage somewhere else, like a splenic vein, portal vein, splenic vein. Three of the five died in one study. Six of the di uh, 11 died in the other study. And the range of the platelet nadir was as low as 14,000 to up to 107,000. So let's review what our cerebral venous sinus thromboses, uh, just what our cerebral venous sinuses are. Here is the superior sagittal sinus and the inferior sagittal sinus. The midbrain flows through the vein of Galen and into the straight sinus, and it all goes down either the left or the right transverse sinus, down the sigmoid sinus to your internal jugular vein. Here's a cadaver of someone who's had um, blue dye impregnated into the cerebral venous sinuses, and you can see just how large they are. Very big. One woman had a left and right transverse sinus blockage, and uh, you can, it was not surprising that she died. These are major vessels that are blocking up. So another factor that they measured and presented in their studies was, it, was that there were antibodies to platelet factor four, which we see in heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Every woman that had these measured was positive. Um, and so when you looked at the levels, they measure optical density in units, and for every unit increase, it's a tenfold increase in the signal intensity. So here's the normal at less than 0.5, and these women had optical densities of over about three, three and a half. Then when you add heparin to this, these patients' blood, it binds because of that and inhibits it, and it goes all the way down 
to uh, nearly zero. So a normal patient would have about the same value. So this increased antibodies to platelet factor four is a common denominator. This article says that five to seven percent of blood donors have a higher than normal optical density, but it's still only 1.6. So the people with these cerebral venous sinus thromboses had an even much higher level than that. So let's uh, look again now at the pathophysiology of what's going on with these viral vector vaccines. Somehow the thromboembolism and the adenoviral vaccines is occurring. So I told you about the DNA um, in the attenuated adenovirus being injected and that antibodies are formed to coronavirus spike protein. Well, the, something about the spike protein or something else is also cross-reacting and um, binding platelet factor four, which is released from platelets. And when it does that, the level goes up, you can measure it. And more importantly, it's activating these platelets to cause a thrombus. And that is the major problem of major vessels. So treatment, response of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia to IVIG is simpler for VIT. VIT is vaccine-induced immune thrombotic thrombocytopenia. And in the first study, of five people, four of them got IVIG. The first one didn't get IVIG because they didn't know any better. The other four had mixed results with their IVIG, but um, patients three and four lived, the others died, and patient two died despite the increase in um, platelets to the IVIG. Other treatments include non-heparin anticoagulant agents such as Argatraban, Danaparoid, Fondoparinux, and Doax. So there's a transition from viral vector vaccines that goes to the activation of platelets. Now how does that occur? And let me go over some hypotheses here. First we have our viral vector vaccine that goes into the syringe. So in order to get into this syringe, I already told you that it's just the spike protein of the coronavirus that's here that makes it there. So once you have um, this in the body, there is this small segment of now transcribed DNA to the coronavirus spike protein. And the hypothesis is that some of this DNA gets to the point where it can be bound by the antigen presenting protein and ultimately to the B cells where antibodies are formed to it, but they also cross react with the platelets that are forming platelet factor four, and it results in activation of the platelets. A second hypothesis is that the DNA that's formed that's transcribed back to the RNA and to the spike protein as it should be is uh, the antibodies that form to the spike protein are also cross-reacting and activating platelets. What is at the bottom of this screen is the actual coronavirus gene. You have your open reading fragments. You have your S here for spike protein. The E is for envelope protein, membrane bound, and nucleocapsid. Remember the vaccine only involves the spike protein. And so it's something about this spike protein that the antibody is forming to protect us that's also uh, cross-reacting with the platelets. A third hypothesis is that there's a problem with the, the viral vector itself. And so uh, AstraZeneca has a uses a chimpanzee adenovirus. Johnson Johnson uses human adenovirus 26. Sputnik V uses human adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5. Again, they're saying the hypothesis is that there's an antibody that forms to the viral vector that also cross-reacts with the platelets and the activated platelet factor 4 to result in thromboses. Well, on August, I mean, April 14th, there was a letter to the New England Journal that says, hey, what's been going on with AstraZeneca? We had a patient with Johnson & Johnson who had similar, um, we had a similar experience. And so they, this was written by Murin family and they wrote about it. And what they said was there was a 48 year old female. She got her Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And then 11 days later had symptoms of malaise, abdominal pain, low platelets 13,000, D-dimer of 117. 
The high normal D dimer is 0.5. This lady's blood must have been like concrete. Her uh, COVID test is negative, which is important as we saw from our first case report. And she had on the CT a splanchnic vein thrombus. Then three days later in the hospital, she had a headache start. They did a CT of her head that showed a thrombus of her right transverse and straight sinuses. And now you remember where those are. She had some blood tests um, performed. The antibody for platelet factor four heparin by latex immune enhanced immunoassay was negative. But what they found is that the test of choice is the ELISA for antibody, IgG for platelet factor four polyanion. That was positive at 2.5 optical density units. They realized what was going on, changed her heparin to Argatroban. If you plot her optical densities on the same figure I had before, you see she falls right here, which is well above uh, normal and in the range of other people who had vaccine-induced thrombotic thrombocytopenia. So what we're seeing is a common denominator that is uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. It sounds like a paradox because when you have thrombocytopenia, you have low platelets. Platelets are what uh, stop up our micro tears in our vessels and cause clots. This is the opposite of that, and yet people are having clots. So to make this diagnosis, it's in the context of getting something, whether it's heparin or vaccine or something else uh, basically foreign, you have a thrombus. It could be a cerebral venous sinus thrombus or other major vessel thrombus. And it's diagnosed by imaging, a surgical procedure, or pathology. And it's in the context also of platelets that they're finding are less than 150,000. So this equals a diagnosis of TTS. If you have a patient like this, then there's a place to report it. And here's the website, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. So they should be getting too many cases, and then they review them and go through them. If they had our first case, they would go through and probably attribute the vessel, I mean, the thrombus to uh, COVID-19, or at least they wouldn't be able to tell which it happened. Was it the vaccine or was it um, COVID-19? Other cases will be clear cut. We had another case, so let's look at case number two. A 72-year-old male with a history of hypertension received the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Seven days later, he presented with left hemiparesis, dysarthria, and dysphagia due to a right-sided intracranial hemorrhage into the ventricle that necessitated removal of a right basal ganglia hematoma. At that time, his platelets were 202,000. He was discharged and now presents from rehab and decreased cognitive function, worsening dysphagia and dysarthria. Now his platelets are 306,000. A CT of the head was performed that showed evidence of his previous stroke. And that's shown here. Here was the original hemorrhagic stroke. And then now he's come back to the hospital. You can see where it was. Well, within the first 24 hours of his second admission, his mental status and respiratory effort worsened. He lost his ability to track with his eyes and an MRI was obtained. And the most clinical significance was a wedge-shaped infarct at the left pontomedullary junction involving the left medullary pyramids, which you see in the uh, center of the head here, that is not on the older scan. So was that a case or not? And that's for the committee to decide. So, so far, we have one patient of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with decreased platelets among 50,000 patients vaccinated. So at that time, Johnson & Johnson did a self-imposed pause to review, and they deemed that there was no causal causality. Then there was a safety surveillance that revealed five more cases. And on April 13th, CDC and FDA recommended a national pause. And so this sets Johnson & Johnson back on their heels and they are in defensive mode. And so they publish a report to New England Journal of Medicine that says here is our defense why we should not be lumped in with the other viral vector vaccines and be deemed guilty by association. We are different than AstraZeneca, and here is why. First of all, they say that there is a background rate of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis of 0.2 to 1.7 or 1.57 per 100,000 person years. And I noticed that one of the references here is reference four. This is a 
an article or a review on cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and it does give a rate, but the word thrombocytopenia does not occur in this article. It is talking about just cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, and I just told you the definition of thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome includes thrombocytopenia. So uh, it's, it is a very rare condition, but it, it's occurring higher than what the background is. The FDA and CDC reported a rate of 6.8 million doses given and having six cases. So we heard on the radio and TV that uh, there were one case per million. And I had a video here to share, but just let me tell you, I'm going to deem Jim Carrey with an honorary medical degree because if you remember his question to his girlfriend, what are the chances of me going out with you? And she said, not good. And he said, not good like one out of a hundred. And she said, not good like one out of a million. And he said, so you're telling me there's a chance. And he was so excited. So what Dr. Carey is telling us is that one out of a million is possible. Um, and what we can learn from this, let me zip by this so I don't. We have six cases and 6.8 million doses. That's the ratio that we were given by the CDC and FDA. And the only thing, the only problem with that ratio is the numerator and the denominator. The six cases may be very underrepresented. Who thinks of a cerebral venous sinus thrombus as a side effect to a vaccine? We're usually thinking my arm hurts, a fever, a rash, something like that. We're not thinking a thrombus. So as we look into more people and that uh, vaccine committee evaluates the cases that are coming in, this number six cases may go up. Also what we um, see here is they reported 6.8 million doses in Johnson & Johnson's paper they said that there were 7.2 million doses. Well, six, seven million doses, it doesn't really matter because what we found out was that's how many doses had been distributed, but really the number that had been given and injected in people's arms was half of that. So if you only have, if you have six cases per three million doses, suddenly your rate doubled. Now, I don't know if the uh, website was active at the time, but what you can look at the CDC reports now is that they report the number of vaccines distributed in the United States. Here we have 17 million. And then here we have the number that are actually administered. And at this time, a couple weeks later, it was 8 million. So that's a good website to, to get a proper denominator of what's going on. So I told you there was a background incidence of this um, CVST of one case per 10 million, but VIT is now five cases per 1 million. So when we have, when we look at uh, the defense by Johnson Johnson, they had two points to make. And one was that the, their spike protein code is different than AstraZeneca. Remember, and I keep saying this, but it's, it's worth remembering that the attenuated vaccine in the, vac in the syringe provides the DNA, it's transcribed to back to the uh, RNA of coronavirus and to the spike protein. And so they are saying the antibodies that cross-react with AstraZeneca do not cross-react with the activated, the platelets and activate them to cause thromboses in ours. Again, this is the entire coronavirus gene. And um, this is just the spike protein. They say that there's a difference between AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson because um, Johnson & Johnson drops this S1 portion that you can uh, see right here on the left side. The S2 portion is on the right side. So Johnson Johnson also highlights another difference with their spike protein code, and that is right here between the heptad repeat one and central helix regions, they make two proline substitutions. And um, the benefit of that is that it stabilizes the spike protein. So the importance of stabilizing the spike protein is so that the antibodies that we make to the vaccine are very similar to the actual spike proteins on the coronavirus when we get exposed to it later. There, the spike protein has a certain shape when it's fixed to the entire cell of the uh, coronavirus. But when you 
make it independent of the rest of the virus in the vaccine, um, it loses its shape and becomes a little bit floppy. And so if you make antibodies to a floppy spike protein, that's not exactly what's going to get presented to you when the real coronavirus shows up. And so this junction right here between the heptad repeat one and central helix is represented by these two cones. Um, and at the top is the crossover. Now this is um, paper is in 2017 with a different coronavirus, but the concept is the same. They took out these two amino acids at the top, put in proline. Remember proline is not an amino acid, but it can substitute as an amino acid because it's small. And when you have this proper shape of the spike protein as it is here, you see buried in the middle are these is the crossover between the heptad repeat one and central helix. And so the um, researchers that did this really found an amazing ability to stabilize the spike protein. It was like Thomas Edison finding out which filament was going to work with his light bulb. We had to try 500 filaments before it worked. They found two uh, amino acids that when they're switched with the protein, it maintains the spike protein when it's independent of the rest of the coronavirus. And so if I were Johnson & Johnson, I would have said this in much more lame person's terms in the New England Journal article because it's such an important message and uh, it really helps their defense. They said it in a bunch of scientific language and I think some of that message was lost. They had another point that their adenovirus platform is different. Remember I told you AstraZeneca is from a chimpanzee adenovirus, whereas Johnson Johnson is from human adenovirus 26. And then uh, Sputnik V is, uses the human adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5. So the antibodies that may be formed to the um, viral vector they're saying with Johnson Johnson does not cross react and activate pl platelets to cause thromboses. Seems to me uh, the chimpanzee, you know, we share over 98% of our DNA with Johnson and Johnson. If they really wanted to be different, they should have used pediatric DNA or teenager vaccine uh, DNA would have been even better. Now the next couple days after they published this defense, there was a JAMA article that summarized cases of women who had received the Jan Johnson & Johnson vaccine and every one of them had cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. This was 12 women. All of them were less than 50 except one. They had um, the same about the same time from their symptoms to the uh, from the vaccine to the symptoms, which was nine days. All 12 had cerebral venous sinus thrombus and eight of them had a, a major vessel block somewhere else. Three of them died. Their range of platelets were less than 150,000. And of the 11 women that had antibody to platelet factor four measured, they were all positive. Now, where I've got AstraZeneca up here, I've got Johnson & Johnson, where's Sputnik V? Well, let me, let me tell you about Sputnik V. I'm just going to sidestep and then I'll come back in a minute. Um, there have been three and a half million received, uh, people have received that since the middle of March. There have been four deaths discovered, but that was on social media accounts, uh, not be, uh, for any other reason. There's no open source death registry in Russia. And this epidemiologist in Moscow says there is a problem with under registration of side effects of drugs in Russia in general. And I don't have any reason to disagree with that. One of the four deaths was officially confirmed by Denis Loganov from the Gamalia Institute. If you don't recognize that institute, you might recognize Denis Loganov because he was the first author on this Lancet paper that provided the data for their phase one, two study of their Sputnik V vaccine. So I want to review that, that paper with you for a moment. They did two phase one, two studies at the same time. So on day zero here, they started their phase one study and they gave people, nine people adenovirus 26 and nine others adenovirus five. And then five days later, they started their phase two study. So this is uh, warp speed. They gave 20 people adenovirus 26 and two and a half weeks later they gave the same people adenovirus 5 and then they had primary objectives where you measure antibody response and other immune 
system responses and they record adverse events. So their adverse events, they had a lot of uh, mild 97% pain at the injection site, fever, headache, stuff we expect, and 3% were moderate with no serious adverse events. I meant to tell you this is in uh, healthy uh, people 18 to 60 years of age and they were hospitalized for the first 28 days. So they got the vaccine and they spent a month in the hospital. The article didn't talk about compensating these people at all. I would not be a candidate. Anyway, uh, when you look at their antibody response, uh, they started at zero because nobody had um, seen coronavirus before. And then over the weeks, two, three, four, they generated antibodies. So this is what you want to see. You want to give a vaccine and then you want to see an antibody response. And that's, that's what they showed here. They also showed that there were T cell and interferon gamma increases that start low and then go high. And then they also measured neutralizing antibody that again have that start low and go high. Now, whenever you have a major paper published in a major journal, then authors typically write comments to the um, editor and say, oh, I saw this point and I wanna add this and I have this question. Well, that was done with this paper and these uh, authors titled their letter, Note of Concern. That's always a bad sign when you see that. It says, we read with great interest the results presented by Loganoff and family. And uh, then they say there are several data patterns which appear repeatedly for reported experiments. Um, now, who's we? Is this just a couple guys in their basement getting ticked off? No, it's 30 scientists um, all over the world. And so what they said was, you have uh, data points, and we've um, outlined them in different colors. So you can see that they are a constant value in two completely unrelated experiments. So what they're saying is that, and they put the figure, <laughs> they put Loganoff and family's figure in their own note to the editor, and then drew these boxes around the data points to show Look at this, they are exactly the same, and sometimes there's only one different. And what is that accusing Loganoff and family of doing? There are three things that can get you thrown out of research, unfunded, and, and never again allowed to have an NIH grant, and plagiarism is one of them. Well, this isn't plagiarism, there's nothing to copy. Nobody's ever had a COVID vaccine um, study before, but, what they're saying in between the lines is that these guys either falsified their data or they just made it up, fabricated it. And so this puts Loganoff, they get the um, opportunity to respond. And so um, they have a response and they know that, that these guys are telling them that their data may be either fabricated or falsified. And so here is the author's response. We thank Enrico, Bucci, and colleagues for their correspondence. The Russians are professional, and they did not learn their professionalism on Facebook or Twitter. They go on to say, Bucci and colleagues have the impression that some figures contain repeated patterns in the data. It's not an impression. They took your figure, and they wrote red boxes and green and blue boxes around it and showed how they're the exact same points. But I still love the um, gesture of professionalism. Um, to us, it is obvious. And if you continue to read in between the lines here, there's insults kind of flying back and forth, but they maintain a very professional language. To us, it is obvious, but not to you boneheads, that after a single immunization, the peak of the immune response is reached three to four weeks later. It is not improbable to obtain the same patterns on the response plateau in small samples. And, and I get what they're saying. What they're saying is you get a vaccine, you don't have any antibodies, it kicks in, you make the antibodies, and the antibodies you have at three weeks are the same at four weeks. And what the reader's response was, was that, yes, we understand that, but you don't get the exact same points at three weeks as you do at four weeks. And so that's what their problem was. Okay, enough with the sidestep. Let's go back to our um, Johnson Johnson vaccine in the US. Here we have CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. They're about to review a, and I'm up to uh, mid-April, 
They're about to review a lot of material from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine to see what to do with it. They are provided with symptoms. There's initial symptoms, there's symptoms later in the clinical course, and the uh, basically, you have symptoms wherever your clot is. If it's a cerebral venous sinus thrombus, you have a headache. If it's your splanchnic vein, you have abdominal pain, and so on. They reviewed uh, the sexes, which was males and females, and age groups. You see males was zero, and females was mostly 18 to 49, so they broke down the ages of the females, and they reviewed that uh, the peak was 30 to 39 years old. That was seven cases in half a million, so 11.8 per million. They looked at the time that it took these women to get their cerebral venous sinus thrombus, six days to 15 days. And they looked at the outcomes. At the time, uh, three people had died, seven people were hospitalized, four were in the ICU, and five were discharged home. So they looked at all the vaccines, Janssen, Pfizer, Moderna, so Janssen, they had this data of six cases per 6.8 million doses. Pfizer had zero, and Moderna had three cases, but uh, none of the people had thrombocytopenia. Then that data uh, was updated, and they had 10 cases with mRNA vaccines. But then they looked at it closer, and five cases uh, were ruled out for different reasons, as you can see there, and five cases did have cerebral venous sinus thrombus, but without thrombocytopenia. So to that point, they confirmed that there were no confirmed cases among 5.2 million doses of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. So the committee had three items on the table. They said, and there's 14 of them, that's why I have 14 chairs here. Vaccine could not be, should not be given to anyone. The vaccine uh, should only be given to adults greater than 50 and vaccine should be given to anyone but with a disclaimer. So these were the three choices basically they were trying to decide between. The chairperson had this to say, to explicitly warn women of the risk of clotting and to offer them an alternative vaccine option would be confusing. I don't think it'd be confusing. Women are smart people, can figure it out. Oh, let me keep reading though. Would be confusing and impractical for many vaccination sites. Well, I don't think that's true either. We have a vaccination site and it's full of bright people and might needlessly discourage people from getting immunized. There is a place for Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but young women, I'm not sure is it. Let's see what else people had to say. One person said resumption of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine would result in 26 to 45 more clotting cases. Ay, yi yi. But they say it would prevent 3,500 ICU stays and 1,400 deaths, presumably from COVID-19, and what was not taken into account is if these people in the green boxes had received another vaccine. <sighs> well, the vote came down. You know where I stand. 10 or yay, four or nay. The next day, this was to uh, vaccine be given to anyone, but with a disclaimer, and that's how it's being given now, with a disclaimer. So it's a uh, full disclosure. The next day, the title was the FDA and CDC are restarting Johnson & Johnson's COVID vaccine. A concern I have is what if you're this poor soul in France who comes up and this it, you walk into the vaccine place and this is what you see. Vaccination Pfizer left, AstraZeneca right, and what if you have been out of the loop as far as vaccine because you have other things to pay attention to for whatever reason. Are we going to let our young women wander right? Are we uh, going to give them information after we vaccinate them? There's a potential here for um, for errors that could happen or cerebral venous sinus thromboses that don't need to happen. We in the United States and, and in France, they have the luxury of making choices. I could see a place in the United States that might look like this. Pfizer, Moderna left, Johnson Johnson right. If you're in a place that you're, you may have a different choice, think about the places in South America or India. India was doing so well, they even had vaccine and were giving it away months ago. Now they're breaking their own record of 350,000 people getting COVID every day. People are dying so many they have to burn them on top of the ground. If their choice is between Johnson & Johnson and nothing, please give them the Johnson & Johnson. There is a great place from here. Getting all excited. Let me go to the next slide. and. Uh, Let's talk about how well vaccines work. 
there have been, the CDC keeps track of the number of COVID-19 vaccine breakthrough infections. And they said more than 87 people have been vaccinated in the United States and 8,000 people have had breakthrough infections. I think that number's underestimated because it's, uh, it's relies on reporting. So let's talk about the efficacy of vaccines. The Johnson Johnson study had 66% but when you looked at just the U.S., it was 72%. Pfizer was 95% and Moderna was 94%. There's a difference between efficacy and effectiveness. Effectiveness is what happens in the real world. Efficacy is what happens in the studies where there's in a controlled environment. So Johnson Johnson hasn't been out long enough to have um, real world data yet. I'm sure it's coming. MMWR just shared a study that showed 90% with Pfizer and Moderna, and that's expected always to be lower in real world than it was in studies. I found a preprint that showed 70% for Pfizer and 170,000 uh, people aged 80 to 83 years old. We'll see what that paper says after peer review. Um, so talking about variants and vaccines, a change in a base pair is a mutation and that new gene is called a variant. So if the variant has a change in function, then it's called a new strain. So there's been a, several new strains and as you can see here, um, the original was A and that's what uh, came over to Seattle where we had our first case. It was on life support and now it's extinct. Nobody has A1 anymore. And there have been other mutations and varieties. And I think what we're most familiar with is this B117 in the United Kingdom. There's B13551 in South Africa, B1429 in California, B1526 in New York, and P1 in Brazil. They're coming up with new nomenclature to improve these letters. Uh, I don't know why they picked P over C. Anyway, let's look at a coronavirus gene. This is a normal one. And now you have a couple landmarks. You see the S1, the S2 portion. You see the heptad repeat one and the central helix. And now let me introduce you to the receptor binding domain. This is the portion of the protein that actually binds the human cell. And so that's a very vulnerable spot to have a mutation. So if we look at the New York variant, B1526, you see that there's several mutations in this variant and two are in the research binding domain and one in particular is the E484K. And if we look at the other variants that I circled uh, that I know are in Kentucky, others are probably present as well, you have um, at least two others that have E484K and they all have mutations in this research binding domain. And there's a couple down here called DEL I wanna point out to you. So what was a theory in the last slide may be shown in the next slide, and that's this uh, brief report from the New England Journal of Medicine that shows a vaccine breakthroughs, COVID-19 infections in people who have been vaccinated. These two people, one of them had Pfizer, one of them had Moderna, and you see that one of them had this E484K. I think we're gonna be hearing more about E484K mutation. The other person had a number of mutations that are circled here. So we'll be aware of that. Um, I'm gonna skip this part about testing and go to post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. I think we're all familiar with people who have had COVID-19 and then have symptoms that persist. In this study, we know the initial symptoms that people have, but you see some of them hang on for two months. Over here, this study shows symptoms that were initial and then go on for three months. And another study shows symptoms that have gone on up to eight months. They compared that in 15% of people who are COVID-19 positive against 3% who are COVID-19 negative, and that was a significant difference. So a study from the CDC showed 3,000 outpatients, two thirds of them followed up with their doctor sometime after their uh, COVID-19 infection, and almost half of the people, when they went to that follow-up appointment, had a new diagnosis. They followed them for six months, and as the six months um, went on, 
their symptoms decreased, but they were not zero after six months. So what I want to um, share with you is that we have a UofL Division of Infectious Diseases post-COVID-19 research clinic. This email at the top is access to our website and it answers specific questions for people. What are we about? What can I expect as a participant? How, can, how to schedule an appointment? Since this is a research clinic, it's free and we plan to follow these people for a year. We've almost we've already seen patients down there, and um, I had some data, but I pulled up the wrong version of my lecture. So just know that we're following more symptoms than I even just showed you in those other studies. And we're, uh, they also have multiple uh, tests down while they're in our clinic. And then if we find something, we would let the primary care doctor know who might be a relevant referral for these people who have different symptoms. So with that, you have absolutely saturated everything I know about COVID-19, but I want to um, reserve some time for questions at this time. Great. Thank you, Dr. Arnold. That was outstanding as always. And uh, if anyone has a question, you can unmute your mic and ask Dr. Dr. Arnold, or if you want to type it in the chat area, I can, uh, I can read it for him. Forrest, thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. And um, as we discuss, uh, this is an important topic for uh, for all of us because this is what patients want to know. What happened with the vaccine? And we need to have uh, evidence of what happened with the vaccine. Now, let me ask you, uh, why do you think that, that if the vector vaccines mm -hmm. produce uh, rare, but you have this possibility of severe thrombosis. Why do you think that we have no report of severe thrombosis with the with the Russian vaccine, with the Sputnik, that has been used in, in several countries in, in Africa and Latin America? Um, I can see why we don't in Russia, because they don't have that registry where they record um, side effects in an organized manner, but you would think where they give it may have that um, place, but even then some of those places are the Middle East and uh, Africa, and so again they may not have as good a registry. Uh, now the four cases we found about in Russia were, uh, they didn't say Facebook, but it was some kind of media online like that, and you would think that uh, word would get out in uh, the areas where they've received the vaccine that those cases have occurred. I hope they haven't. Um, maybe they're out there, but uh, I don't know, you know, they're not as organized in their record keeping, I guess. Uh, more meanwhile, questions? We, uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry Dr. We wait Rick. for questions. Yeah, meanwhile, we wait for questions. Um, uh, for us, considering the, the variants at this article in New England Journal of Medicine that, that now some of the vaccine means some of the variants, uh, uh, and the, the recent data from Moderna that they are changing the RNA vaccine to close to treat some of the variants, what do you think, and another very common question that we get from the patients, do you think that we're going to need a, a booster of the vaccine? And how often we are going to need to repeat a, a booster of the vaccine? That's a good question. And when they came out with the vaccine in the first place, they even talked about maybe needing a vaccine later on, six or 12 months later, but they weren't sure. I hear more talk about them um, coming up with a new vaccine and improvements. So I wouldn't be surprised if we hear that a booster is needed. And I've even heard that yearly, you'll have to go get your flu shot and your COVID shot because both of those viruses tend to mutate and we need to fine tune and get that done. I think that um, they wanna give a booster vaccine sooner than they can make uh, the vaccine available. So I, we should hear about that in the next coming months, but it may not be available because they just can't generate it fast enough. Can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, this is Stanley Levinson, and um, used to be with pathology, but I'm with medicine now. But in any case, uh, in, in the New England Journal, just you could comment, I have about three or four things I'd mentioned. Uh, one is, I think if you look at that New England Journal paper that you just mentioned, 
the number of cases were no higher than one would expect. I think it was like five and four hundred, which comes out to be five percent. Uh, so I'm not really sure it was due to the mutant. That is, they would have had to uh, uh, ch uh, find out w w which virus strains or whatever you want to call them had been going around in that area uh, because it was what you would expect at about 5%. Uh, the other thing is when I look at these vaccine papers, one thing, it's hard to compare them, of course, because they're all different, but uh, one thing I try to look at is the convalescent uh, serum compared to how many how high the titers were in the vaccinated people. And uh, I think if you look at that, you find that the two RNA, RNA vaccines show uh, titers that are up with the highest of the convalescent serum, whereas the others don't. Uh, and the other thing I would mention is there was a, a paper from the Netherlands showing that uh, cerebral thrombosis occurs in about 15.7 uh, people per million. And I've tried to make some calculations, and I can't really show that the number in that large number of 8 or 9 million people that were vaccinated is really much higher over a year than the baseline value. So. I'm still not 100% convinced that uh, that's due to the vaccine. So, like, could you comment on some of those ideas? Uh, yes, I'll start with your last point. And uh, what uh, Johnson Johnson said the same thing that the cerebral venous sinus thrombus occurs, and there's a background rate that's the same. And the point I was trying to make is they do occur, but they don't occur with thrombocytopenia, which is what we're seeing with uh, the, these viral vector vaccines, because it's thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, which doesn't make any sense. You bleed with low platelets. So that may be the difference here, and it may have been the difference in Netherlands. I haven't seen that data. Uh, there have been uh, several breakthrough cases with uh, people who have had the vaccine, that's true, and you're right that the uh, the numbers that we're seeing with the mutations are probably approximate to what we would expect because we don't expect any vaccine to be 100%. What's impressive is that this COVID-19 um, efficacy and effectiveness both are higher than we see with influenza, so they've done a, a pretty good job of making a vaccine. And then um, regarding the convalescent Plasma, I haven't reviewed the data between the different vaccines, so um, I'll just have to believe you on that one, that the mRNAs have a, a more robust response than the other. It doesn't mean that uh, people who, there's, there's a, it doesn't mean there's a population who shouldn't get vaccinated, except for those under 16 or whatever it is, and even that population, I hope they're coming out with a 12 to 16 um, age group that can get vaccinated. Well, well, may I also say that I really appreciated your lecture. It was very excellent talk. Oh, thanks. And and especially the information on how to stabilize the uh, the uh, proteins in the vaccine. Oh yeah, good. I'm glad you appreciate that. It's uh, it's a little weird talking in an empty room and wondering if anybody's still out there. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Arnold. Um, I'm Peter Hasselbacher, an emeritus professor. Um, thank yes. you for a spectacular summary of a fast-moving issue. Um, we've known from the beginning of the COVID uh, epidemic that, that uh, microvascular injury occurs in the lungs, that there are megakaryocytes in the lungs, that, uh, that thr microthrombi are formed. Um, uh, how can, how would, uh, and then we also know that patients clinically have a lot of thrombotic events, both small vessel and large vessel. If we use raw platelet count as a measure of, or as a diagnostic point for the, the new vaccine-induced syndrome, um, what would happen if we were to measure some other uh, uh, measure of platelet activity, like sticky platelets or, or some, something other than raw platelet counts, uh, which would represent a massive consumptive thrombocytopenia? Uh, 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 what would happen? Could we identify some cases without uh, without the uh, the plate account going down? I'm sorry if I've confused that. Thank you. No, but I think the 
when they found that you can measure the antibody to platelet factor four, they really hit on a common denominator there. And even then they had to figure out which um, antibody, and there's a poly anion lab test as well, that kind of links all these cases. And it was impressive that in all the cases of AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, in anyone who was measured, that their test was positive. Um, so you'd like to get a hold of, of other people and, and see. Now, the cases I presented that we've seen here, they were older men and they, their platelets were 200,000. Um, so, but who's to say, you know, ex if there are no men and, and the exact cutoff for the platelets? I think the highest they had was 127,000, but all of this is a little up for discussion and that's why we should be reporting more people than actually have the problem. And uh, I'm all for platelet function tests. We do, you know, hematologists do that for other diseases. And if they can find another test, uh, I think the platelet factor four antibody is probably a send out test. And just like we had, for example, interleukin six as a blood test that we were able to order since COVID, but we couldn't really order before this antibody to plate effect for four, maybe a test that's done a lot more frequently and is more available now that we have um, COVID-19. Any more Jason, questions? I more questions for Dr. Arnold? Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. thanks, everybody. And